It is my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Markus Hilgert. Um, he's a German Orientalist and director of the Museum of the Ancient Near East in the Pergamon Museum of the National Museums in Berlin. Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz. I do not translate that. <laughs> It's my pleasure to say it in German. Okay. From 2007 to 2014, Professor Hilgert um, had a professorship in Assyriology. Is it the right pronunciation? Uh, with a focus on Sumeriology. Difficult for me. At Heidelberg University. In 2013, he founded the Heidelberg Zentrum uh, Kulturelles Erbe, Heidelberg Center for Cultural Heritage. There with complements the existing network of German initiatives uh, that take on the sustainable implementation of the World Heritage Convention at national and international levels. Professor Hilgert is, since 2009, a full member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts and was from 2009 until 2015 chairman of the German Oriental Society. Good. Since 2008, Professor Hilgert has been a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute, and so on, and so on, and so on. We are very, very happy that you are here today and uh, giving us the keynote with a very important topic and you know, introducing us into the field of uh, our, or into the overall background of our topic today. The theme, the theme is Sustainable World Heritage, Political Challenges for the protection of heritage in the event of armed conflict. We have a chance to hear Professor Schipper tomorrow. So to hear, today we have Professor Hilgert. Thanks for coming and uh, yeah. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. It's an honor also for an Assyriologist to be invited to a conference that is dealing with conflict-solving strategies in the heritage discourse. This is not what I was raised and educated to do, so please bear with me um, if I don't quite hit the topic or miss some of the points that you are interested in. I will not give many answers today, but I will try to raise some of the questions that I have been dealing with, especially over the past year. And I think that we'll have time to come back to some of these questions after my talk. Sustainable heritage. I'm tempted to claim that the events of the year 2015 have taught us one rather painful lesson. There is no sustainable heritage. Too vivid, the images of plundered world heritage sites, destroyed temples, blown up palaces, burned libraries, and murdered scholars. Too shocking, the fate of the millions who once lived with or cared for this heritage and are now forced to take unspeakable risks to save their own lives and that of their children. And too obvious the paralysis of the international community in the face of the enormous violent provocation inflicted by Daesh, the so-called Islamic State. However, I think there is also something else we have learned in 2015. We have learned that in principle, we're not quite as helpless as it may seem, especially not when it comes to the protection and sustainable development of cultural and natural heritage. We have come to understand that, in principle, we possess the knowledge, the experience, the legal frameworks, the technologies, as well as the capacities to protect the world's heritage, even in situations of crisis and war. And Last but not least, it is beginning to dawn on us what would be necessary to put these tools to effective use, what we need to do in order to create situations of sustainable heritage preservation 
within the ever-changing political, social, and cultural settings in which cultural and natural heritage finds itself. Before I will try to outline which steps and measures I consider necessary in this context, let me briefly clarify what I associate with the terms sustainability or sustainable heritage. Here I would like to stress two points. One, obviously there is no absolute sustainability. What may be achieved are varying degrees of sustainable human and non-human resource networks, the resilience and sustainability of which depending entirely on their design, their actual operativity, and the nature of the threat affecting them. And second, in my understanding, sustainability is not a material or social attribute characterized by specific object ensembles or static social political parameters, respectively. Rather, I define sustainability as a discourse, a permanent discursive process, ideally involving government, business, and civil society. Sustainability is a discourse that is academic as much as it is social and political. It is a discourse that is constantly evolving and flexible enough to acknowledge and accommodate changes and challenges. Why do we have to think of sustainability as a discourse? Because both on a national and an international level, it involves mobilizing a wide range of participants, agreeing on a common vision, developing a joint strategy, and using shared resources for consensually prioritized objectives. Once sustainability is understood as a discourse, it becomes apparent that the challenge of attaining it is not necessarily one of lacking knowledge, sparse financial resources, or insufficient capacities. Rather, the challenge of sustainability lies in setting up a discursive framework which allows for all of the participants to communicate on equal terms and utilize the existing resources effectively. I would argue that sustainability in the preservation and development of cultural and natural heritage is an excellent example for the overarching discursive quality of this process. Therefore, it is not too early to conclude that the first and foremost political challenge and responsibility with a view to the sustainable protection of the world's heritage is the establishment, facilitation, and moderation of the pertinent discourse as its crucial prerequisite. However, there are also other, more tangible challenges and responsibilities involved when it comes to protecting cultural and natural heritage in the event of an armed conflict. Not all of these challenges and responsibilities are political ones. Both as a scholar specializing in ancient Mesopotamian studies and as the director of the Ancient Near East Museum at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, I know from firsthand experience that sustainable heritage preservation also requires expert knowledge and institutional infrastructures through which this expert knowledge can be applied and transferred. It is for this reason that today I will discuss not only some of the political challenges the World Heritage Community is faced with, but also the responsibilities of archaeological museums like the Ancient Near East Museum in the implementation of pertinent research projects and capacity building measures. Let me start with the political challenges that I would count among the most vital ones when a sustainable heritage protection is to be achieved. For those among us who have been following the fate of outstanding heritage ensembles such as archaeological sites, historical monuments, or nature reserves all over the world, the massive threat to these ensembles is not a recent phenomenon, but one that is as old as humankind's interest in its own past and in the history of its natural environment. 
For apart from natural disasters, this threat derives from the indiscriminate greed of collectors and dealers, political instability, urban or economic expansion, military activity, or voluntary destruction of historical monuments carried out as a means of propaganda and with a view to the humiliation of the enemy. And recently we've witnessed a lot of that, especially in the MENA region. It has been in response to this long-standing multifaceted peril that under the auspices of UNESCO, the international community has created legal instruments such as the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, the 1970 Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property, or the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage from 1972. Very recently, on 25 September 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, comprising a total of 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Goal number 11, as you know, deals with sustainable cities and communities and contains the strategic target to, and I quote, strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage, unquote. Given the considerable and constant attention the protection of the world's cultural and natural heritage has received over the past decades on an intergovernmental level, and given the fact that in 2010, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs defined a global challenge as, and I quote, any major trend, shock, or development that has the potential for serious global impacts and thus to create humanitarian needs and change the environments in which humanitarian actors will operate in coming years, given these facts, one could contend that a sustainable protection of the heritage of humankind should be counted among the global challenges of today's world. This seems to apply in particular at a time when armed conflicts are threatening the uniquely rich heritage of the entire Middle East near Africa and North Africa region with complete annihilation. Based on these considerations, I would argue that in addition to promoting the sustainability discourse both on a national and an international level, another political challenge of key importance is the acknowledgement of sustainable heritage preservation as a highly complex political task of global dimensions. For I am convinced that only this acknowledgement will generate the strong political will and mobilize the material and immaterial resources necessary to develop a global strategy for sustainable heritage protection. Above all, this global strategy should focus on the following pressing matters. One, the dissemination of the idea that the crisis of the world's cultural and natural heritage is an integral part of the global humanitarian crisis and has to be addressed as a violation of the fundamental rights of humanity. Two, the development and implementation of concepts for heritage preservation, the complexity, flexibility, and transcultural applicability of which must correspond with the global dimensions of this challenge. Three, the effective implementation of the existing pertinent intergovernmental treaties and conventions on a national level. Four, the identification and coordination of all relevant stakeholders and the empowerment of these stakeholders, as you've just put it, is of course also very important in this process. Five, the assessment and coordination of existing pertinent capacities, knowledge and experience alongside with their human exponents. Six, the identification of and support for all academic disciplines that contribute to heritage protection on various levels. This applies in particular to academic disciplines with precarious infrastructures. This is a discourse that we're following very closely in Germany now that is linked to the so-called Kleine Fächer and my own field 
um, astrology, which is basically cuneiform studies, is such a very small academic field that turns out all of a sudden to be very important in the context of heritage protection. Seven, the development and creation of the infrastructural and technology frameworks for sustainable heritage protection, especially in situations of crisis and war. Eight, the design of financing schemes for heritage protection that are characterized by sustainability, adaptability, and above all, shared responsibility. And nine, the sincere effort, particularly in the global north, to avoid any kind of discursive asymmetry or neocolonialism in these processes. Even though that it is true, even though it is true that one of the primary political challenges of a sustainable heritage protection is the development and implementation of a corresponding global strategy, it is also the case that building a global heritage network of capacities and resources would not have to start from scratch. In fact, there is an increasingly large number of intergovernmental bodies, national and international institutions, non-governmental organizations, and civil society activist groups dedicated to the protection and development of cultural and natural heritage. Among the most important ones are UNESCO, ICOMAS, IUCN, ICROM, ICOM, the International Committee of the Blue Shield, and even the International Committee of the Red Cross, not forgetting the numerous, numerous um, NGOs and activist groups that are basically springing up um, anew every day. With their member organizations or national committees, these institutions represent an impressive pool of knowledge and infrastructural capacity in the area of heritage preservation. In addition, many concrete measures and instruments that could contribute significantly to the implementation of a global heritage protection strategy are already known or in the process of being developed. In order both to demonstrate that the international community is not without powerful responses to the current violent threat against the world's heritage and to illustrate what capacities and resources are required I have recently proposed a program of 12 such measures and instruments that I consider relevant and applicable in this context. With reference to UNESCO's five strategic objectives for the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, the five C's, very well known in this room, I'm sure, credibility, effective conservation, capacity building, communication, and community involvement. With reference to these five C's, I've called this program the, five, the 12 C's, of heritage protection in situations of war and conflict. It comprises a total of four measures in each of three areas of engagement called prevention, action, and innovation. The four preventive measures that I've recommended are criteria for prioritizing heritage protection, contingency planning, comprehensive cataloging and digitization, and crime prevention and criminal justice the last measure of which stressing the necessity to use all available legal instruments to combat the illicit trafficking in cultural and natural goods, arguably the biggest single threat to the world's heritage. Once situations of crisis have developed, four additional measures are indicated. Constituting the area of engagement called action, these measures are coordinated intelligence sharing, cultural crisis intervention teams, civilian support networks, and co-opting potential stakeholders. To be certain, the cultural crisis intervention teams I'm proposing are not military units, they're also not blue helmets, but groups of heritage experts that possess a high capacity for intercultural communication and are protected by security specialists. As it is obvious that a sustainable protection of cultural and natural heritage will not be feasible without a certain degree of disruptive innovation, I have also proposed four rather unconventional measures of, uh, designed to provide the political, institutional, and financial setting for a sustainable heritage protection. They are change management, core facilities, cooperative funding models, 
and cyber heritage resorts. Among these four motors of innovation, I would like to stress the importance of core facilities, that is, shared infrastructures and technologies for heritage documentation and preservation, especially when it comes to the digital documentation of archaeological sites and museum collections, a topic widely discussed at present, it is undeniable that sustainability of the pertinent activities can only be achieved when the generation, storage, and flexible use of the pertinent digital data is not a prerogative only of the global north, but rendered possible in particular for the countries currently affected most by heritage destruction. It is obvious that the implementation of a heritage protection agenda as complex and ambitious as, and ambitious as the program of the 12 Cs requires both substantial political support and extensive administrative coordination. However, equally apparent in this context is the need for expert knowledge and institutional infrastructures tailored to the peculiarities of cultural and natural objects. This explains, in my opinion, why public expert institutions like museums are called upon to play a much more active role in the area of cultural heritage preservation and why it is of utmost importance to count museums among the institutional pillars of a global strategy for the protection of the world's heritage. At the same time, one has to concede that many museums would have to adapt their self-image and activity profile if they wanted to be prepared to accept this institutional responsibility. Therefore, in the second half of my presentation, I would like to talk about this institutional responsibility of museums in the quest to preserve the world's heritage using the ancient Near East Museum at the Pergamon Museum as a convenient and pertinent example. And you will have noticed that in the title um, I've inserted and institutional. I've taken the liberty to expand the topic a little bit and at the same time make it a little bit more concrete. In order to better understand what the possible challenges in this process might be, I first want to take a closer look at the specific situation archaeological museums like the Ancient Near East Museum find themselves in at present. My contention here is that today, archaeological museums, especially in Western Europe, have arrived at a critical juncture. They're faced with pressing historical burdens, difficult ethical choices, and a theoretical discourse that at times questions the very idea of the archaeological museum itself. Most importantly, however, in recent years, many archaeological museums are confronted with additional complex challenges linked to the political and cultural crisis in the countries from which the objects in their collections originate. There is no doubt in my mind that the future of archaeological museums as public spaces of education, transcultural encounter, and multi-perspective discourse, as well as their social and political significance, will hinge on their willingness and ability to meet these challenges, to take on their individual historical burdens, and to make the appropriate ethical choices. The Ancient Near East Museum at the Pergamon Museum, with its close to 600,000 archaeological objects, mainly from Iraq and Syria, is one of these museums. Like many other public repositories of archaeological objects in Europe, the Ancient Near East Museum was founded at the end of the 19th century as a museum for the art and architecture of non-European societies of the past. Among the highlights of its permanent exhibit are the, at the Pergamon Museum are reconstructions of the Easter Gate from Babylon, as well as the processional way from Babylon and the monumental stone sculptures excavated at the site of Tel Khalaf in Syria. More than 95% of the objects housed at the Ancient Near East Museum stem from regular, well-documented archaeological excavations. They entered the collection on the basis of partage agreements with the respective countries of origin. 
I would like to demonstrate that the Engineering Museum is well on its way to become a public expert institution for cultural heritage research and preservation, serving both as a core facility for cultural heritage protection and a public, high level, highly visible advocate for the archaeological heritage of Iraq and Syria and much of the entire MENA region. With its recently diversified portfolio of corresponding tasks, the Engineering Museum is redefining its institutional function on a national and international level, thereby providing an answer to the crucial question how collections of objects established in a colonial or imperial context can continue to have a meaningful role in a post-colonial world, a role that, especially at this very moment, is painfully growing aware of the political asymmetries and cultural chasms left behind by colonialism and imperialism. Before highlighting some of the pertinent activities, projects, and measures at the Engineering Museum, let me outline in very broad strokes which challenges many archaeological museums are up against and what the possible choices are. The first challenge archaeological museums like the Engineering Museum are presently facing is an internal one. It is the challenge posed by their own past. I'm referring to the fact that many archaeological museums in Western Europe started building their substantial collections of non-European archaeological material at a time when the political and cultural relationship between the countries of origin and the target countries was marked by a distinct power asymmetry, even when there was not any immediate colonial or imperial domination. To be certain, I'm not claiming that archaeological museums necessarily acted illegally against ethical principles or involuntary exploitation of these asymmetries when they acquired objects through archaeological excavations or in the art market. But I do think that archaeological museums with pertinent collections need to acknowledge the historical burden represented by the political, social, and discursive inequalities surrounding their establishment in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. However, merely acknowledging this historical burden is certainly not enough. Rather, archaeological museums proactively need to assume responsibility of their past and strive to establish comprehensive accountability with regard to their object's history by carrying out systematic and methodologically sound uh, provenance research. It goes without saying that such comprehensive provenance research cannot undo wrong or revoke past injustice. But the sincere attempt to inquire systematically into the circumstances under which archaeological objects entered a museum's collection and to render accessible the extant documentation to the respective countries of origin and the public is an indispensable prerequisite for institutional transparency and a decisive component of bilateral reconciliation processes. Most importantly, comprehensive provenance research is the door through which archaeological museums enter the floor of post-colonial international relations. The second challenge for archaeological museums has an external source. It is the post-Second World War critical theoretical discourse in the humanities and social sciences, a discourse that has systematically deconstructed not only archaeology and its conceptual premises, but also historiographical narratives of development and modernity, as well as the idea of culture as a static and essentialist phenomenon. In addition, this critical discourse has highlighted and unmasked the strong constructive power of museum exhibits and the surrogate cultures they invoke through creating artificial object ensembles out of fragmented archaeological situations. Today, archaeological museums need to find the right balance between a multi-perspective transcultural object presentation that takes into account these theoretical considerations on the one hand and their undeniable task to document, contextualize, interpret, and publicly display material remains of past societies in a generally accessible manner 
on the other. The third and most powerful challenge archaeological museums like the Ancient Near East Museum need to address derives from the fact that probably for the first time in human history, the cultural heritage of Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and many other countries is threatened by complete annihilation through damage from military activity, voluntary destruction by political extremist groups, or systematic looting by criminals, the latter being lured into this shady business by notoriously high profits in the flourishing illicit antiquities trade. It is my firm conviction that museums must not close their eyes against this global threat to the archaeological heritage of humankind. Rather, they need to acknowledge their moral obligation and social responsibility to mobilize and apply their unique expertise in the international fight to protect the cultural abundance of the past. Why is it our moral obligation and social responsibility to engage in this fight? because we would not be public expert institutions and we would not have the capacity to help if the countries of origin, now in turmoil or under attack, had not agreed to share with us their rich heritage and because it is in our own vital interest to promote cultural diversity and academic freedom in these countries. For I would contend that the future success and public acceptance of archaeological museums will largely depend on their ability to forge strong alliances with the respective countries of origin. Against this backdrop of historical, theoretical, and political challenges, the Ancient Near East Museum has been adapting its institutional profile since 2014. To the key components of this institutional profile, we have added comprehensive provenance research, as well as the development of multi-perspective presentation concepts, both carried out with a view to the complete redesign of the Ancient Near East Museum and its successive reopening in 2025. In addition, we are actively engaged in initiating research projects and practical measures that may contribute to the fight against illicit trafficking in cultural goods, build capacity in the area of cultural heritage protection in Iraq and Syria, standardize processes of preventive digital documentation, and raise awareness of the need to develop global strategies to preserve the cultural heritage of mankind for future generations. Carried out with considerable financial support from the German government and in cooperation with powerful partner institutions such as UNESCO, ICOM, the German Commission for UNESCO, these endeavors may illustrate what the role of an archaeological museum in situations of war and conflict can be. Let me briefly highlight the most important ones. Illicit trafficking in cultural goods, as I've said before, poses the biggest single threat to the cultural heritage of humankind. For institutions with high visibility like archaeological museums, fighting illicit traffic starts with taking a bold public stance, adhering to a strict code of ethics, and implementing best practice guidelines. At the Ancient Near East Museum, pertinent measures include a general no acquisition rule, even if we get sent things in the mail like we did twice this year, a very restrictive policy on the preparation of experts' reports, as well as comprehensive provenance research. Other decisive factors in the fight against illicit trafficking in cultural goods are the close communication and cooperation with the respective countries of origin. As the Interpol expert group on stolen cultural property concluded during its last meeting in June 2015, data gathering and systematic research are of high relevance for combating the illicit traffic in cultural items. Together with an extended network of partner institutions including UNESCO, ICOM, the Federal Criminal Police Office and the German Foreign Office, the Engineering Museum is spearheading a new national research project analyzing the illicit traffic in archaeological objects, mainly from Iraq and Syria in Germany. Funded by the Federal Ministry for Education and Research for a period of three years, this research alliance features an innovative methodological design combining academic and non-academic expertise. Among other things, the transdisciplinary research project called ELICID 
aims at developing and testing criminological methods for an in-depth analysis of illicit traffic in cultural goods, focusing on object types, turnovers, networks, and operation modes. We're hoping that the results of our research may also contribute to the successful long-term implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 2199 on a national level. At the heart of capacity building lies the exchange of knowledge and experience between experts. We're facilitating this interpersonal knowledge transfer by bringing to Berlin colleagues from our partner institutions in Iraq and Syria in order to discuss all questions related to the protection and study of archaeological heritage. Currently, for instance, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation is hosting two conservators from the Syrian Directorate General of Antiquities and Museums who are attending an intensive training seminar in the preventive conservation of cuneiform tablets at the Ancient Near East Museum. Concentrated work sessions like these play a crucial role in establishing the international expert networks urgently needed for a sustainable heritage protection on a global level. At the same time, it goes without saying that the transfer, development, and implementation of knowledge need an adequate political and infrastructural framework to be in place. Together with our colleagues from the Iraqi Ministry of Culture, we're aiming at defining the parameters of such a sustainable capacity building framework in the context of the Iraqi-German expert dialogue on Iraq's cultural heritage at archaeological sites and museums, ICASM. A joint initiative by the permanent delegation of Iraq to UNESCO, the German Commission for UNESCO, and the Ancient Near East Museum, this expert dialogue is funded generously by the German Foreign Office. It was inaugurated with the first round of bilateral consultations at the end of July. These talks centered on several fundamental topics, such as the current capacity building priorities as perceived by Iraq, the adequate principles of implementation, as well as the types of required infrastructures and technologies. Some of these required infrastructures and technologies still have to be further developed or modified in order to meet the challenges of cultural heritage documentation and protection especially in situations of crisis. This applies in particular to innovative technology, technologies such as the 3D digitization of archaeological objects. Bearing in mind this research deficit, the Engineer East Museum has been leading in the establishment of a new center for digital cultural heritage in museums, CDCOM. Financed by the Federal Commissioner for Culture and Media, CDCOM serves both as a research institution and a core facility for all of the archaeological collections of the Berlin State Museums. Among the center's objectives are the generation, storage, and flexible use of 3D models of archaeological objects, as well as the optimization of mobile and economical solutions for preventive 3D documentation in situations of crisis. An essential tool both in the fight against illicit trafficking of cultural goods as well as in the area of awareness raising are the red lists of cultural objects at risk produced by the International Council of Museums, ICOM. For the 2015 update of ICOM's emergency red list for Iraq, the Engineer East Museum has provided a considerable number of provenanced objects, object descriptions, and a German tr translation. The German version of this timely update has been sponsored by the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and will be launched on January 14, 2016 in Berlin. Finally, and this may seem very, very vain and, and conceited, but it's not, it's just trying to make a point. Um, finally, ranging among the best frequented museums in Germany, we're perfectly equipped to raise the general public's awareness of the importance of protecting the cultural heritage of Iraq and Syria from illicit trafficking. We're using this potential by actively striving to attract the media's attention to the pertinent topics. This is why I end up like this. It's, it's a tool that we're using to raise uh, the general public's awareness. And in addition, we're proud partners of UNESCO's global Unite for Heritage campaign, 
However, our partnership with UNESCO in this extremely important enterprise is not only aimed at spreading the word about the imminent threat to the world's cultural heritage, rather, we're also developing new formats for an intensified mutual transfer of research data and expertise. Coming to a close, I would like to underline what I consider to be the most important political and institutional challenges in the context of creating a sustainable framework for heritage preservation and development, especially in situations of crisis and armed conflict. First of all, we need to fully comprehend that more than anything else, sustainability is a discourse, a multi-voiced and colorful discursive process involving a wide variety of participants, both on national and international levels. A sustainable heritage discourse among global partners acting on equal footing can thus also become a means of social integration, cultural reconciliation, and post-colonial intergovernmental report. Furthermore, the common point of departure for all actual measures towards sustainable heritage protection has to be the realization that the preservation and development of the cultural and natural resources of humankind is a global challenge in need both of a global strategic response and the corresponding political will for implementation. A global strategy for sustainable heritage protection could largely build on existing capacities and resources as exemplified by the 12 C's of heritage protection in situations of war and conflict. However, such a global strategy must also possess the visionary force that allows for the inclusion of unconventional, innovative instruments corresponding with the high complexity and volatility of the process. Given the multiple challenges they currently face, and given their potential key role in crisis and armed conflict, public expert institutions like the Engineers Museum possess a specific capacity to contribute significantly not only to this global strategy for sustainable heritage protection, but also to bilateral reconciliation efforts, thereby establishing a new operative paradigm for archaeological museums. Whether they will be able to live up to this potential will depend entirely on the pertinent institution's openness to these tasks, as well as on their willingness to adapt their institutional profile accordingly. However, in the face of the violent cultural extremism and the brutal narratives of hatred and death that are haunting us these days, museums are able to embark on this promising mission by disseminating the one narrative they're perfectly cut out for, that of social diversity, cultural equality, and infinite human creativity. Thank you very much.